the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. I confess. God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. O God, who founded all the commands of your sacred law upon love of you and of our neighbor, grant that by keeping your precepts we may merit to retain eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Hear this, you who trample upon the needy and destroy the poor of the land. When will the new moon be over, you ask, that we may sell again our grain, and the Sabbath, that we may display the wheat? We will diminish the ephah, add to the shekel, and fix our scales for cheating. We will buy the lowly for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. Even the refuse of the wheat we will sell. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, never will I forget a thing they have done. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, first of all, I ask that supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be offered for everyone, for kings and for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. This is good and pleasing to God our Savior, who wills everyone to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as ransom for all. This was the testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed preacher and apostle. I am speaking the truth, I am not lying. Teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. It is my wish then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. The word of the Lord. be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Jesus said to his disciples, a rich man had a steward who was reported to him for squandering his property. He summoned him and said, what is this I hear about you? Prepare a full account of your stewardship because you can no longer be my steward. The steward said to himself, what shall I do? now that my master is taking the position of steward away from me. I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they may welcome me into their homes. He called in his master's debtors one by one. To the first he said, how much do you owe my master? He replied, 100 measures of olive oil. He said to him, here is your promissory note. Sit down and quickly write one for 50. Then to another the steward said, and you, how much do you owe? He replied, 100 cores of wheat. The steward said to him, here is your promissory note. Write one for 80. And the master commended that dishonest steward for acting prudently. 
For the children of this world are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. I tell you, make friends for yourself with dishonest wealth so that when it fails, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. The person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy in great ones. And the person who is dishonest in very small matters is also dishonest in great ones. If, therefore, you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? If you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Today is the second of seven consecutive Sundays on which the second lesson is taken from one of the two letters in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul to his young apprentice, Timothy. Remember that Timothy, brought to the Lord Jesus by Paul, was the son of a Gentile, Greek, pagan father and a Jewish mother. His mother and grandmother had both become Christians as well. Timothy traveled with Paul on his second and third missionary journeys, undertook several special projects at Paul's instructions, and finally, by the laying on of hands and the gift of the Holy Spirit, Paul appointed Timothy to be the Bishop of Ephesus, the great city in modern Turkey, which was a crossroads of Greek and Jewish civilizations. 1 Timothy, from which we read this morning, has two main objectives. Paul wants to help young Bishop Timothy do two things. First, refute and correct the false doctrines of Gnosticism. We'll come back to that. And second, help Bishop Timothy organize the life of the local church and prepare to spread it by planting new churches. Gnosticism, to return to the first point, we could spend a semester course trying to understand Gnosticism and not complete the task. It was and is a melange of strange doctrines, a mixture of Greek philosophy and elements of Jewish mysticism with bits and pieces of Christianity sprinkled on top. Among the chief errors of Gnosticism was the belief that the universe was not created by the being we call God, but by one of his creatures, the Demiurge, and that the universe, the visible universe, and all in it are emanations from this creature of God, and that human persons are sparks of the divine temporarily encased or imprisoned in our bodies. Another error of Gnosticism was the belief that in order to be restored to the divine realm, our liberation, our redemption, our salvation is accomplished by acquiring esoteric knowledge of deep mysteries. You see, in the Gnostic view, our separation from God is not the result of sin, but merely of ignorance. It's in the context of refuting Gnosticism, including these particular errors, that we read last week from 
Paul to Timothy, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul is insisting our estrangement from God comes not from ignorance, but from wickedness. The only solution to which is the cleansing of our sins, our forgiveness, which is accomplished by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's in that context that we begin the second lesson today. Now remember, the second purpose of this letter is to help Bishop Timothy organize the life of the local church, including especially the liturgical assembly, divine worship on the Lord's day. Here, it's helpful to remember that in the time of Paul and Timothy, there was no, not yet a hard and fast distinction between the synagogue and the church. And Christi Christian worship was developing from synagogue worship, the reading of Torah, the singing of psalms and canticles, to which Christians added the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. So, first of all, I ask that supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be offered for everyone, for kings and for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. This applies most especially to the worship of the church. That's why we still have in the sacred liturgy the bidding prayers, the universal prayer, the prayer of the faithful, in which we offer petitions for all those in need, including civil authority. Implicit in this instruction, is a distinction recognized by Paul, taken from the teaching of the Savior himself, that there is a distinction between civil society and the church. Meaning, Christians can live in almost any arrangement of political authority and social structure. The gospel does not include a plan for how people should be governed. Kings and emperors, czars and prime ministers and presidents, the only thing Christians cannot tolerate is living in a system designed to exterminate Christianity. He continues, this is good and pleasing to God, praying for all in authority. This is good and pleasing to God our Savior, who wills everyone to be saved, who desires everyone to be saved, and here it is, and to come to knowledge of the truth. The strange word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. Here, Paul is using that very word. God desires that all be saved. How? By coming to knowledge. It sounds like he's conceding the ground of Gnosticism, but immediately he shifts to the other foot to come to knowledge of the truth. What truth? that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so the text continues, for there is one God, not a demiurge who created the universe. There is one God, there is also one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus himself, man, who gave himself as ransom for all. He's repudiating the heresy of Gnosticism and teaching Timothy how to do the same. This was the testimony at the proper time. He's bearing witness to the gospel. For I was appointed preacher and apostle, teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is the task of Bishop Timothy and of every bishop, priest, and deacon, everywhere and always. Now he continues, and remember, he's describing the liturgical assembly. It is my wish then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Think of the gesture of priests. Every time a priest prays out loud in the Eucharist, it's with hands raised up. Remember too that at this time, in the synagogue, families did not sit together. And in Orthodox congregations, they still don't. If you went to a synagogue today of an Orthodox congregation, men and women are segregated taking different places in the assembly. So, he says, similarly, women should adorn themselves with proper conduct, with modesty and self-control. By the way, the lectionary doesn't include what I'm now reading, 
The lectionary edits the text and stops with men should pray with their hands held up in peace. It stops there because the editor of the lectionary didn't want to make the preacher's job difficult. But I, being cantankerous, will rush in where others fear to tread and grab the third rail. Women should adorn themselves with proper conduct, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hairstyles or gold ornaments or pearls or expensive clothes. We'll come back to that in a minute. But rather as befits women who profess reverence for God and good deeds, a woman must receive instruction silently and under complete control. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was firmed, formed first, then Eve. Further, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. But she will be saved through motherhood, provided women persevere in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Is St. Paul a misogynist? A superficial reading of the text might suggest so. But if this is the inspired word of God, Something else has to be going on when we read this text at its proper depth. First of all, remember that this applies primarily to the liturgical assembly. And then to see this text in its context, we have to look what follows immediately. It's about ordaining bishops and deacons. And a few verses later, he adds priests to the list. He's telling Timothy how to organize the local church, including especially how the church worships. Seen in that light, these detailed instructions about what women should and should not wear to church is simply, in some way, common sense. We don't dress for church the way we would to tailgate or for a cocktail party or the prom. The larger point is for all Christians to bear themselves in simplicity and modesty and have as their principal adornment a holy life. The more important point, though, is about the place of women in the liturgical assembly. And here, the Catholic Church, together with the Orthodox churches of the East, remain united in our witness that only men may be ordained deacon, priest, and bishop. The very point Paul continues to discuss after this section I just read. Why? Well, remember the first task, refute Gnosticism. One of the errors of Gnosticism was the belief that the authentic human person, the spark of the divine, which is temporarily imprisoned in the flesh, is neither male nor female. This is an error found in in a variety of ways in Greek philosophy before the time of Christ. Judaism, on the other hand, and Christianity after it bears witness to the truth that the distinction between man and woman is at the very heart of the created order. Male and female, he created them. Yes, men and women are equal in human dignity. Men and women are equally the bearers of human rights. Men and women are equally redeemed by Christ. Men and women are equally heirs to the kingdom of God. Men and women are equally in Christ, given access to the wisdom and the power of God. But the distinction between male and female and the complementarity between men and women is not arbitrary. It's not conditioned by culture. It's rooted in human nature. In our time, the new Gnosticism says that a man can become a woman if he wants to and vice versa because there is no givenness to human nature, there's pure will. One of the constant conceits of all science fiction is that if we only had the right machine, and one woman and one man, we could use technology to take the essence out of the woman and out of the man and change places, like two birds in cages that we simply switch. Holy Scripture, however, And the church's liturgy respond, no, that's not so. Because we are not imprisoned in our bodies, we are enfleshed souls. And we will, after the resurrection of the dead, be embodied persons forever. We are not pure spirit, we are not angels. We are a substantial unity of body and soul. 
And for that reason, the difference between men and women is a real difference. Which is why Paul says here, in discussing women in the liturgical assembly, that their path will not be the path taken by men. It will be a specifically female path that for the vast majority will include motherhood, either physical or spiritual. And that this role in the assembly is different from that taken by men, especially the ones ordained to the order of deacons, priests, and bishops. I realize this is a profoundly counter-cultural way of looking at human nature. But the gospel always calls us to exactly that perspective on all things human. To see the possibility of mistakes like Gnosticism and the errors to which they lead people in a variety of ways. And the reason Paul wrote to Timothy, the reason this text is included in the New Testament, the reason I'm discussing it today is to help us understand ever more deeply the truth revealed by God about our origin, our nature, and our destiny. We are not men and women by accident. The difference is real. And in the distinction is the very basis for the complementarity that allows the human race to continue. Without fathers and mothers, there are no children. And even in cases where by death or divorce, one parent is taken away from the children, the parent who remains, remains either a mother or father. Even if a man has to do tasks normally done by a mother, or a woman has to do tasks normally done by a man, the mother never becomes a father or vice versa, because these are not mere functions, they are identities rooted in our enfleshed, embodied nature. And that makes a difference too in the way the church worships. Paul wanted Timothy to be prepared to teach the truth of the gospel, to rightly arrange the life of the church so that everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, could come to know and be saved by the saving truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. 
I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the whole world. Grant, gracious Lord, that all who confess your holy name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Call more young men and women to the sacred priesthood and religious life, that the gospel may be preached to all nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless husbands and wives in the sacred bond of marriage, that by their love and fidelity, they may be witnesses to the love of Christ for his bride, the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort, strengthen, and heal those who suffer in body, mind, or soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Have mercy on all the dead that your saving will for them may be fulfilled in the kingdom of your eternal glory. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, give us strength to proclaim the gospel by our words and deeds, that all men may come to the gift of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. All visitors are most welcome, and we invite you to return soon and make St. Mary's your spiritual home. Next week, we'll have a guest preacher at Mass, Father Benedict Keeley, the founder of a charity called Nazarene, which supports persecuted Christians in the Middle East, especially in Iraq. There are contribution envelopes for Nazarene in the pew racks today, and there will be again next week when we'll take a collection for the support of the persecuted church. Please see the e-bulletin, especially my column, for more information about this important work of mercy. Please also see the e-bulletin for a quick look at the history of Catholicism in upstate South Carolina and for information about our school open house the first week of November. On Sunday, October 6th, we will host a blood connection blood drive. And in the e-bulletin, you can find more information about the drive as well as instructions on signing up to donate. Finally, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive with favor, O oh Lord, we pray, the offerings of your people, that what they profess with devotion and faith may be theirs through these heavenly mysteries, through Christ our Lord. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. 
Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and love of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving your thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mysterium Fide. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Robert our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world, all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, 
O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, a glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold you who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Graciously raised up, O Lord, O surin you with his sacrament, that we may come to possess your redemption, both in mystery and in the manner of our life, through Christ our Lord. Oh, 